I'm Aisha, your host for today. Welcome to the ECN Cup 2020. Today, our segment is called From ASEAN to Asian Football Powerhouse. So let me introduce you to our guest today. First, we have all the way from the Philippines, Chris Kretwich, Academy Director of Kaya FC. From just across the causeway, Sutesh Nair, Head of NFDP Johor, who is also the scout for JDT Academy Football Club, and one of our own, Coach S. Subramani, Coach Education and Coach Developer, member of the FIFA Century Club. Welcome to our show today. We are very honored to have you. Thank you for taking the time for this webinar. Okay, um, so briefly, this webinar will be talking about um, youth football in general. And we'll um, I'll ask you about your career, your experience, and just youth football in general for, for this session. Um, before we begin, maybe you can just, each of you, just introduce yourself briefly about your background and just what you are doing now. Let's start with you first, Chris, don't mind. Okay, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Um, it, it's nice to connect with all of you this morning. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, in, a, in a previous life, I was a, a national team footballer. I uh, played for, for 10 years with a national team, 50, 51 caps. Um, started off as the, the first Phil Foreigner, as, as I was called uh, back in 2004, um, and was part of a wave of a generation of, of Philippine uh, footballers who were born and raised abroad who came to apply their trade in the Philippines. So um, I've seen a lot over my, over my time um, being involved with the, with the national team set up. And in 2013, I moved from my, um, uh, my job in, in the US, where I was working at the time, to come back to the Philippines to, uh, to live here full time, to join the professional league as it was the, the UFL back in 2013, um, and then participate with, uh, with the national team. Uh, but part of my remit was also to be the academy director of Kaya FC, which is one of the professional clubs here in the Philippines. So I was having a dual role of uh, playing with the club and also being their academy director um, and, and trying to hang on for dear life with, with the national team at that particular moment in time. Um, I then retired from uh, playing in, in 2012 and then became the head coach of Kaya in 2013 and uh, I oversaw uh, the the first team operations for three years, but we did particularly well. Uh, we won a couple of uh, domestic cup competitions as well as um, having a, a pretty good stint in the, uh, the AFC Cup, although we were beaten rather heavily in the knockout rounds by JDT in, in, uh, in our first ever uh, AFC Cup uh, soiree. Um, and then more recently, I've been involved also with the, with the full national team, so as the assistant coach with the, with the, with the men's national team, uh, as well as continuing my role um, here with with KFC Academy, so that that takes me up to to the present day, um, and uh, yeah, just really enjoying working with the kids. That that's that's something that I really enjoyed doing and, and very passionate about. Okay, how about you, Coach um, Sutesh? Tell me about yourself. Yeah. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Uh, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a former player. Uh, with uh, started with Johor. I'm uh, born in Johor uh, and raised there. So started my career there in the youth and as well climb up to the senior level. And uh, um, from there, I moved on to uh, Penang. I was playing for Penang State for two years and I was playing for uh, Public Bank, in the Super League, and also MK Land and Malacca and, you know, had a career of uh, more than 10 years in the Malaysian League. Uh, and I uh, retired uh, from football around 2006. And I was uh, 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 not involved in football uh, after, after my, my career is over. And uh, for, I think, close to seven to eight years. And when opportunity came in for me to go to JDT Football Club uh, in the academy level, so... I went in there, you know, I've uh, been around four years there with, uh, uh, with the JDT Academy. Um, and I've got a national call up for, for Merdeka and uh, ASEAN Cup, actually, uh, with the national team. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, I think uh, that's about it. Uh, now I'm also uh, heading another program. They call it NFDP, National Football Development Program, uh, which is uh, national based and uh, in, 
in 14 states in Malaysia. So I'm actually heading the program in Johor. So I have around nine centers to monitor and we develop the coaches there to football education and, you know. So my job is uh, also uh, moving from district to district to, to, to check on the centers and, and how the coaches were uh, executing the, the program mm -hmm. in Johor. Yeah, okay, I think that's about it. Well, big pass that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big task. Okay. Um, really. Good money. How about you? Tell us about you. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ash Subramani. Uh, I'm a former national footballer. I was part of the national team since uh, 1996 to 2007. And uh, during that period, I managed to play for the national team uh, 115 times. Uh, so I got uh, 115 caps with the national team. And at the same time, I was also a professional footballer uh, playing for two clubs in Singapore, which is uh, Tiong Bahru Football Club as well as uh, uh, Home United Football Club. And after my playing career was over, then I went into coaching for a few years, which I would be Home United as an assistant coach, after which I joined the national setup and I've been part of the various uh, age group up to the senior level uh, in terms of coaching. Till, till date and currently I'm also involved in the coach education setup since uh, 2010 and our, our, our task now is to develop coaches to improve the level of football in Singapore and at the same time I'm also a, a lecturer in uh, physical education at uh, IT College Central which is one of the technical institutions in Singapore. Um, that is my current job. And on top of that, I'm still involved in football actively. Yep. Okay. All right. Oh, I'll start with my first question. So you were all, um, well, I'll go with you one by one, all right? Okay, so you were all players before. So has it always been the plan to go into coaching after retiring as a player? Um, I'll go with you first, Chris. Has it always been the plan? Uh, initially, when I first, you know, made my progression from sort of youth team into professional football, it, it wasn't really the plan. I think I was quite a difficult young footballer um, to handle as a coach, and I, and I, I maybe had a few issues with authority. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I never really foresaw myself becoming a coach per se uh, in my formative years as as a footballer. But as I grew older, I really enjoyed um, any opportunity that I had to work with young people. Um, I really enjoyed being on the grass and, and imparting some of the knowledge that I'd learned over time um, through my professional football career. Um, and as I got older, I, I found myself wanting to learn a little bit more about why coaches um, adopted a certain approach or why certain sessions would be put on in a specific way. And I, I sort of accidentally fell into, into that. Uh, into that space uh, and then I really sort of honed my skills when I when I moved to America uh, I moved to America and coached there and you know we were delivering three four sessions a day every day for you know 45 weeks of the year and then and that's really how you you sharpen your tools as, as, a, as a coach and actually I sort of moved away from the playing side and, and really focused more on the on the coaching side but it was only a really a, a fortuitous change of of luck um that enabled me to, to come back to playing. So uh, at that point in 2013, when I came back to the Philippines, the opportunity to play and then temper that with building um, Kai FC Academy, which at the time was very small, um, was, was the perfect synergy of roles for me. So um, although I didn't anticipate me becoming a, a coach when I first started uh, my professional journey, it, it's something that I fell into and, uh, and now really, really enjoy. So um no, I, I, I don't think I was always destined to be a coach, but it's something I, I'm really thankful that I fell into. Oh, great. Very interesting. Uh, um, coach Shashutesh, you mentioned that you had a gap um, where you were not involved in football, but was coaching something that you have always had in mind when you were playing, maybe? Uh, yes, actually, you know, I used to uh, talk to my coaches uh, and I had, so some very good uh, coaches who are very patient. I think uh, some of them are uh, very big names. Jita Singh from Singapore. 
And Steve Darby was my coach back then. Uh, Tukumaran, Juan Jama, and Ella Warrison, and all these all these people. Uh, you know, I can always uh, consult them, and also I check with them why they do certain thing this way and that way. Like uh, how Chris was mentioning just now, as we get older, we get uh, more involved. We start to just not think of first as a player. We we start to you know. Uh, think more and that's when you know the questions came in and and i was really interested back then to know how things work so that's how you know when when uh uh when, like like you were asking me just now the the gap yes uh during this moment i was coaching in a in an academy in a private academy uh on saturday and sundays and uh that's when when in i think in 2012 uh uh the crown prince of Johor, TMJ, he embarked on a grand plan to uh, he became the president of uh, Joe football station and he combined the professional teams under one roof and he started to uh, build things from the grassroots mm -hmm. so that's the moment i thought uh, you know uh, this is a moment for me to to come into the jdt family and uh, also he really welcomed former players, former Johorians and all that. So that's how I got involved back into football again in a serious way. Yeah, must be very exciting for you. You are Joho through and through, right? <laughs> yeah, you can say <laughs> that. Okay, uh, Coach Mani, how about you? When you were playing, did you ever think that you would be a coach one day? Uh, to be very frank, Aisha, I, it was not part of my plan uh, going into coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, when I was playing for United, uh, I was also the captain for the club. And because of my experience as well as the captaincy, uh, they offered me the coaching role after my retirement in 2009. Uh, so I went into coaching as a assistant coach with the first team. But uh, to be honest, I did not enjoy my coaching thing the first few years of my coaching because of the things were happening. And I'm, I'm actually, as a player, was very particular about discipline and uh, how to look after yourself as a, as a footballer. That was my key things. But what I saw when I went into coaching was otherwise, and that really put me off. So after two years, I told myself, uh, perhaps this is not what I wanted to do. So I had this opportunity to move into teaching. Uh, that's when I went into my current job, which was teaching, and I'm here for almost 10 years now. But of course, football has been always a uh, part of me ever since young. So I still cannot move away from football one way or another. So I still was involved in coaching with the national setup from under 23 to all the way to the national setup uh, till today. And also at the same time, I'm also involved in the coach education uh, segment. Yep, that is my in terms of football currently. <laughs> I think I think for Singapore especially, we need people like you. We need to keep you around. <laughs> okay, um, Chris. So compared to Singapore and Malaysia, football isn't really the number one sport in the Philippines. You know what? So what do you think about football in the Philippines now compared to when you were playing? Has it improved yeah. or? Yeah. yeah, it's it's very different. It's very different, the landscape of, of football in terms of the national team. So when I first came, for example, back in 2004, I was pretty much the only player who was born and raised abroad. Most of the guys who played on the national team were from uh, local institutions, colleges, universities, or from the armed forces. Um, so I was pretty much the, the only one who was born and raised abroad. If you look at our national team now, you know, everyone's from... Uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, uh, UK, America. There's very few um, homegrown talents that are uh, that are in the, the, the current national uh, national men's setup. So in that regard, it's it's completely different. Unfortunately, at the grassroots level, not very little has changed. Um, as you said, one of the issues that we have here in the Philippines is that it's not the number one sport. Um, we have to play second fiddle to to basketball. Uh, obviously, everyone's big on boxing here. Um, so traditionally, all of the best athletes are obviously pushed towards basketball. Uh, 
So that is one of the big issues that we have here in, here in the Philippines. Um, the, the other issue that we have here is it's typically a more affluent sport. So most of the kids that come through the system have a tendency to come from more affluent backgrounds. So we're missing out on a, an entire subset of, of, of individuals from a specific demographic, which if you look at it across the globe, you know, majority of the players, um, for example, if you come from Latin America, if you come from Europe, most of them come, come from lower social economic backgrounds. So we prototypically don't have players from, from that particular demographic. So that in itself means that we are working with a smaller pool of players who we can potentially have um, at the grassroots level. And then finally, there's, there's definitely a lack of, of recreational facilities that we have here, which, which means that the opportunities, especially where I live here in Manila, there is a dearth of just open space and open greenery where people can play. Um, so it's very hard for you to develop your, your skills outside of more formal settings. So the majority of the football that is being played is actually in structured environments. So things like your schools or in your formal trainings that you have with your clubs. Now, again, if you look at most of the how, how players develop across the globe, a lot of it is, is learned on the streets, in the playgrounds, in the cages. Uh, and unfortunately, that type of culture um, just isn't here in the Philippines. So those are the, some of the problems that, um, that, that we have here in, in, in the Philippines. And it hasn't really changed in, in my time um, that I've been living here since 2013. And unfortunately, that's had a knock-on effect uh, with the grassroots development. I mean, there are a few clubs like myself uh, here at KFC that are trying to develop things, um, but those clubs are quite few and far between. So in terms of grassroots development, that there ha actually hasn't been too much, uh, too much change, unfortunately, in, in the period since, uh, since I retired from playing. Okay, well, I guess at least you know that there there are more kids started to play football and compared to before when you were playing, right, in the Philippines. So I would, yeah, I would say I would say there are there are more kids um, that are playing. Um, it, it's just a case of trying to harness them and and having them participate to try to develop them onto the next level because that that's something that we're seeing a lot of uh, now. There, there's there's the YFL Youth League that's been set up. Um, some of the teams have been participating in your Singa Cup tournaments over, over, over recent years. But yeah, it, it's more a case of uh, across the whole island, um, it's just been difficult to, to continue that progression that we've seen from the men's level. It hasn't really trickled down to the, to the grassroots level as such. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Coach Ritesh, as you know, JDT is a big team in Malaysia and South Asia. So, you know, um, and and as as we know, J only JDT in Malaysia that has a proper football development program, right? Um, as for a club in Malaysia. So, what is the do you think is the key to having a a good development program, a good development setup, um, in Malaysia? Do you think it's a uh, it's important to have a good um, support from the owner or good facilities? What do you think is a, is the factor? Okay, actually, uh, my view is, uh, uh, you know, when TMJ took over uh, the conference, took over uh, the club, uh, he had a clear vision and a philosophy, and he started to uh, bring in the good people. Uh, currently, the technical director, uh, Alistair Edwards, uh, and also uh, development manager, Coach Suku, who is also vastly experienced in youth development and also at the senior level. And we had ma many good people that he brought in into, uh, uh, into the setup. Uh, and also with the uh, coaching development, you know. Uh, and it goes hand in hand with the infrastructure all this plays a, a big part. Uh, so, uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, in Malaysia, uh, if you want to have a pathway from the academy level, from the grassroots to the senior level, yes, JDT is the only club who provide that at the moment, from under 12 up to the senior level. You know, they, they, they play the same football, the philosophy. Uh, I mean, uh, the coaches and all that must fall in line with the with the philosophy of the club. So, and also, um, TMJ, he handpicked the coaches from uh, Spain, from Valencia, World Club. Uh, 
and uh, what's happening here also the local coaches were, were given uh, a lot of help to uh, coach education and and you know for the coaching license and all that were paid by the club actually so it's a it's a thorough development uh, from the coaching side plus also on the uh, uh, I mean, on the infrastructure and uh, good facilities and all that, you know, over the years from 2012, it has been uh, a lot of uh, good uh, development on on that side. Uh, but I would like to add uh, in uh, uh, coaching. Uh, I mean, uh, for for the youth development, uh, running parallel is uh, also they call it uh, Academy Moktadari which is uh, it's a nationwide program, which is I'm part of as well. Uh, they call it a National Football Development Program, uh, running in 14 states. Uh, currently, they have, uh, in Johor, we have nine uh, centers. Uh, and it's the same in every, uh, every state. So they follow the same uh, way. And uh, this is to, to, to find the, the best in, in Malaysia uh, that will go into Academy Moktadari and they have layers actually they have a uh, federal sports school and state sports school and also they have PLDs which is uh, 13 to 17 years old and also there's another uh, uh, center they call it Academy Tunas which is 7 to 12 years old so all together around 12,000 uh, kids are in this program and also around 610 coaches uh, in this program. So uh, this is real uh, football education nationwide from the, uh, from the, I mean, from the NFDP program. But for club, if you want to find a pathway for a player from, from the academy straight to professional level, yes, uh, JDT is the, is the club that is doing this. But uh, Salango and there's Felda United and all these clubs, they are also, uh, they have this plan as well, but uh, they are far behind from uh, what JDT is doing currently with the vision of uh, the Crown Prince. Okay, that's about it. Yep. Okay, that's all great examples, I think, for, for everyone in around Southeast Asia. Well, but how about? Singapore coach money. What what are the efforts being done there to develop football from the grassroots? To be frank, uh, the current state of Singapore football is, is not optimal. Uh, as you know, uh, in the recent results from the various competition, we have not been doing well as compared to our regional uh, friends. Uh, but having said that, uh, there are plans in being played uh, in uh, in plan. Uh, where we hope to change the whole ecosystem of Singapore football. We, it's one of the areas which we have neglected so far is, uh, is the youth development stage. I think this is one of the important uh, areas which we have to focus on currently because uh, what's happening now is players are being uh, injected into the senior level quite early. Uh, there is no proper development and there's no uh, plans for them and pre preparation for them to be able to cope with the pressure and the expectation in terms of higher level football. So because of this, uh, we have a challenge in terms of national setups. And of course, uh, due to the lack of football education in Singapore uh, and lack of uh, emphasis on youth development, there are talents which have been neglected or chances are some of them are moving out of the system because of this. And of course, you knowing Singapore, there are high emphasis of, in terms of education rather than sports. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of uh, talents has been uh, moving away from sports, in particularly uh, football. So that's one of the areas which currently uh, FAS together with Singapore Sports are planning to revamp the whole uh, issues. Uh, they have brought in a new technical director from Australia. Uh, he together with a team of uh, coaches as well as uh, staff are uh, coming up with plans to revamp the 
whole ecosystems in Singapore. Hope this whole thing can change and finally be able to bring our football back to where it was many years back. Because when the time when I was playing, of course, football was uh, at a stage where it was doing well regionally and we have been winning competition regionally. But after once we reached the millennium years and things have been going downward. Uh, so hope this whole thing can be changed very soon and we can bring the excitement back to Singapore football again. Okay, well, hopefully. So it's clear that it is a different landscape of football in Philippines, Singapore, and as well as Malaysia, right? So, um, you know, Chris, do you, do you for, for your uh, program, for, for the kids, do you look at, who do you look at, um, you know, for your program? Do you look at teams in Southeast Asia or abroad? What, what is your model, do you think? Well, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have uh, grown up in the UK system, um, coached in the US, and obviously spent a lot of time here in Asia. So I've got a number of different influences and, and I've been very fortunate to have worked under many different coaches um, with different philosophies, different ideas, different theories. One of the things I think you have, to, you have to take into account when you're in a role like mine, whether it be a director role of a club or whether you're overseeing a, a group of teams or a region or a country in, in any kind of um, directorial role, is understanding the nuances of the group that you're working with, uh, understanding the landscape of the country that you're in, uh, and then obviously trying to tailor that to fit it as, as, best, uh, as, as best as possible. So one of the things I've noticed is there's a lot of coaches that have come to the Philippines. I'm sure it's probably the same in, in Singapore and in Malaysia. And without understanding the culture, without understanding the ethos, without understanding the, the nuances of, of each individual country, they've tried to instill their philosophy and, and not understood why it, why it hasn't worked. Um, so... You know, for example, with, with the Philippines, we have huge issues being an archipelago. So just traveling from island to island is, is very, very difficult. So, you know, having um, a cohesive, uh, systematic approach to, to football and try to collaborate with each individual regional FA is very, very difficult. I'd imagine it's much easier in Singapore where travel is, is more freely, uh, freely possible. There isn't so many traffic issues, um, you know, things such as this. So um, understanding the nuances of, of uh, each individual country, I think, is really, really important. And then trying to, like, for, for me, for example, it did take me a long time to, to actually figure out how um, the landscape of Philippine football worked at the grassroots level and then try to understand that the political issues uh, because that's a very difficult landscape to, to try to navigate. And then from there, formulate my own philosophy, you know, pulling from my experiences as a player, uh, pulling from uh, my experiences with different coaches and their philosophies, understanding the culture of the club. Obviously, we have to adhere to the culture of what, of what the, uh, in my instance, what my chairman is, is, is wanting. Um, you know, with, with JDT, I'm sure you have to deal with the crown prince and what his ideas and what his philosophies and with his ethos is. Um, you know, so blending that all together and trying to find the formula that that works. Uh, and as well as that, obviously, putting on your own imprint as, as an academy director uh, in, in the style of which you want to play. So, you know, once I, I wouldn't say it's it's a specific style. It's, it's more of a hybrid of all of the things that, that I've experienced, you know, looking at the type of, of player that the Philippines can produce. So typically quite uh, small, agile, dynamic type players. Uh, and then molding that into a philosophy that, work, that works for our organization. So, so in answer to your question, I would say ours is more of a hybrid style. It isn't, it isn't necessarily something that's uniquely British or uniquely Spanish in, in, in its origin. It's more of a hybrid that I think is unique to the Philippines and, and, and hopefully is something that we can continue to replicate um, throughout all of our underage age groups. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean... Philippines eventually will have their own identity, right? And then and that's very important. Okay, um, Coach Sutesh, so as a coach of young players, right, what are the factors that, you know, these young players need, you know, besides their technical abilities to be, to hopefully one day be a, a good player? You know, what, what, what does a player need? You know, good, you know, mentality, the diet, what, what else are you teaching them at JDT? 
Okay, actually, uh, you know, uh, first of all, we want them to to be good people with good values. You know, that's what we teach them here in the in the academy. But at the same time, uh, uh, we also uh, talk to them. Uh, you know, uh, instill in them to be uh, better players by constantly improving uh where where they are lacking you know and also to be in jdt you need to have uh, certain standards so uh they have to uh, uh i mean mold their characters all this you know uh example also like the first team players they will regularly come to the academy and you know talk to the players and you know motivate them and all that and also uh this to also let the players in the academy know that one day you can reach uh, that height and it's very much possible uh, and this this professional players have done it but you need to uh, have certain attitudes you know towards uh, towards having that uh, uh, sporting life you know uh, and also uh, to play in a big club like JDT you need strong mentality especially the expectation and all that so this is what also we instill in them, and and the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, the JDT attitude is to win, but to, but to win in the right way. So all these, uh, I mean, uh, all these uh, characters, examples, we give them, you know, and we slowly instill in them this uh, this behavior. So. Uh, like uh, and also the diet and all that i think every club has that uh, with the diet but these are the other things that we also instill in them yep how about in singapore coach money is it the same are they what is that what they're doing too uh i sure the thing is that in singapore i think we are trying to uh, plan our own dna because we have a different culture here in Singapore with uh, different uh, nationalities, uh, national, uh, different races. So we have to blend them into our football as well. Uh, I always believe in terms of players, not all talented players uh, and gifted players are able to form a good team. Definitely, they need to have uh, certain values like how Sutesh mentioned earlier, uh, values like uh, positive attitude as well as good work ethics is very important uh, for young players as well as uh, players in general. I think in order to form a team uh, comprising of uh, good players, it is very essential for us to have this attitude and values, uh, especially whether they are following the coaches' instructions and how they deal with uh, uh, pressures and failures, all important and whether are they able to work together as a team. Because in a team, then naturally, there will be some egos and different cultures. Uh, how we are able to bring this together is the key ingredients to, to form a successful team. I think that's one of the areas which I, I guess uh, here we are trying to work because of the different cultures we have. But having said that, uh, currently, like I mentioned earlier, we have our new technical director on board. Uh, he's coming out with a new philosophy as well as a uh, football structure here in Singapore, which we quite recently, we discussed about this thing with uh, a panel of coaches. And I, I guess a lot of things are in place, but it will take some time for us to really see the fruit of this labor. Uh, as we know, in football, there's no shortcut for success. We have to be patient. And I'm sure if all the things are in place, uh, we need to really give ourselves some, some, some time to see the difference and hopefully can bring football to the place where we used to be. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Chris, this is a question for you, all of you, but I'll start with Chris first. What is it that, you know, as a coach and as an academy director now, what is it that um, will, it may not happen yet? Um, makes you happy and proud to see when it happens? What do you think? Oh, tough question. Um, 
I think, especially when you work with, uh, with children, I, I think the most important thing really is to see the development of the kids. And that can take shape in a number of different ways. So as an example, if you're working with you know, low-level players or grassroots or recreational players, just seeing them train with a smile on their face, see them enjoy playing the game, see them having fun with their friends, seeing them interact. You know, I think that's something that I get immense joy from and it's unbridled, it's, it's very pure. Uh, and that's something that I really enjoy about working with, you know, at the very basic grassroots level, that's something that I, I get a lot of pride out of during my, my, my role as, as an academy director. Uh, and then, you know, as you go through that system, it's, it's, it's definitely on a spectrum because you also want to see players fulfill their potential. So, um, you know, seeing them succeed, for example, if they manage to break into the youth national teams. You know, I think we had a number of our kids that, that broke into the youth national teams this year. And, and that gave me immense pride to know that we had them from a six, seven, eight year old and see them develop to play in their under, under 15s, under 17s uh, at the underage level. I think that, that's, a, that's a tremendous achievement. And then obviously seeing kids develop to realise their full potential. So whether it's, you know, they go off to college, whether they play at the uh, sea games level where they go on to progress into the men's national team you know these these things give me immense pride and and, and that's the reason why i think as coaches you know we do the job that we do because we do want to see that development and that development can take shape in, in a number of different ways but but that's what gives me personal pride that's what gives me joy um in in the job that i do because I, th I think football uh going to your sort of previous question i think football teaches you so many life lessons um, so it's not necessarily just about the football side. You know, it's about using football as the vehicle to teach them about life because at the end of the day, we're not just trying to develop them as footballers. I think we're trying to develop them as, as, as human beings. So teaching all these other things through football, things like respect, um, good manners, um, you know, sportsmanship, uh, teamwork, all of these things. Um, you can learn a number of different ways, but for me, the best way to learn all those things is through sport and, and my favourite sport is, is football. So... Um, you know, I think that's that's really important that you don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, and and as for me, that's the main reason why I, I got involved in, in coaching is, is, is to, to use football as that vehicle to help hopefully just develop these kids and, and enrich their lives as a whole, not just to, to develop good footballers. Okay, how, how about uh, you, Sutesh? You maybe have a different view because football there, there's such a high expectation in, in Malaysia what, 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 what is it that when you when it happens you you feel that that is so a big achievement or a, an achievement for you personally is it when a, when your player goes to get a call up in the national team or what do you think yeah I mean uh, at this moment yeah we have some examples of uh, the player from the academy who are you know playing in JDT too, uh, the professional level. So it's a huge satisfaction to to see them there. And uh, yeah, I mean, basically we look at uh, the 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 level of uh, uh, if you are in the grassroots, uh, like what Chris was telling, you know, uh, the, if the player develops, it, uh, even even in a small way, yeah, we are happy about it. You know the. But uh, when it comes to elite level, yeah, they have a target and all that. So when we see them move from uh, uh, from the lower level and slowly they climb the ladder up to the senior level, yeah, it is it is uh, a lot of satisfaction to to see them grow. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, Coach Mani, you you you're teaching, right? So. Yeah. So maybe you you especially have a different take on this. I mean, what what is your what, what makes you proud uh, when 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 something happens with what you're doing? For me, uh, I would say I would like I would love to see the culture back in Singapore, football culture back in Singapore. And those were the days where everybody would be talking about football, practically every household. And when you go out to the neighborhood. Uh, neighborhood you can see people talking about football and kids playing around with the ball that used to be more exciting at that point in time but that has been missing to a certain extent now i hope we can bring this culture back because football is the only sport i believe can touch a lot of people in singapore and that's the only sport which can attract uh, thousands of fans into the stadium so i guess 
the the over emphasis in terms of education which is also uh, killing this this uh, element of uh, sports in singapore i hope this can change soon and at the same time not only developing a footballer but at the same time a good human being that is very important for us because not all footballer will, will play or able to play to certain number of years but of course they have to take another spectrum where they have to go into other careers as well so eventually if you are able to prepare a good human being a good uh a player then that will set a tone for them to 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 carry on for the rest of their life which is very important because uh like i said in singapore education is also important at the same time we also need to focus on sports so that at least we can give them a holistic development in that area that is something which i'm always looking forward to and given an opportunity that's one of the areas which i would like to develop in singapore yep okay all right i think we we'll, um reach the final question for today so chris what is your dream for philippines football as a whole the dream what do you want to see the dream uh my dream is to keep singapore where they're at i don't want them to come back up again i, I can't be dealing with that anymore <laughs> <laughs> they can they can stay where they are. Um no, I think the the dream for the dream for Philippine football again I have to look at it from from all all different angles. I think for the national team it's to continue to progress. You know, we we've, we've seen them make great strides obviously making the Asian Cup was a huge a huge milestone for the national team. It was the culmination of a lot of hard work and to be involved with the coaching staff and actually go to um go to Dubai for the competition was 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 an amazing experience to work with Sven Goran Eriksson and, and to have someone like of his caliber you know take the team I mean that was un, unthinkable when I first first started you know to have someone of that pedigree to be involved with our national team um it was quite a surreal experience so you know for us to continue that development Scott Cooper is doing a great job I think now he's a great coach so hopefully he can continue to take the the national team on so that's just going to be a natural progression I hope and uh we're we're churning out players from um from abroad on on a regular basis so that conveyor belt will keep hopefully yielding um some really good positives but i think in order for us to progress we still need to work on the grassroots initiatives to restore a little bit of parity between those guys who are born and raised abroad compared to the guys that we have who uh, are, are being raised here in in the philippines because that's really where the disparity lies and and that's if i'm being honest that's where there's been a little bit of discontent um amongst the philippine football community because i think you know, while our identity now is quite clear on the pitch it's not great off the pitch we've we've lost that connection i think with uh, with the general football fan here in the philippines and and we've actually seen that with um you know a lack of of uh, interest really with the national team in terms of spectators for our domestic league etc so from my perspective i would love to see that develop a little bit more so the grassroots initiatives have more money and more investment getting more coach developers in at the grassroots levels to try to level up um the youth uh, segment of of the national program and then the development of the of the national league here uh, unfortunately that that seems to have had a backward step in in recent years so hopefully that the national league can uh, can find a more even footing and we can potentially have an opportunity for those talents that are coming through the pathway to to apply their trade here in the Philippines and have a bona fide professional league because at the moment it's it's a little bit fractious and uh it's a little bit yeah it's it's not a great position at the moment with the, with with the national league and obviously the covid situation hasn't helped so uh my hope is that we can come out of this covid situation uh with with some semblance of a professional league and and hopefully continue to uh to progress that because i think in recent years you look at clubs like Ceres for example you know they've been very dominant on the southeast asian um stage and, and certainly one of the premier teams in the region but even they folded in this it, during the course of this pandemic so you know how how will the the club level here in the philippines develop that's that's what i would like to see um hopefully find a more more, more even footing because uh, without the the structured grassroots initiatives and without a, a bona fide professional league it's going to be very difficult for the philippines to continue to progress at the rate that it has done um so yeah that's really my dream is is to is to make sure that those things are in place to in order some sort of level of sustainability here in the country 
has things started yet there for for you? I mean, I just started okay. No, so the kids are still they're still locked up. So all of our sessions are done via virtual sessions. We have the odd sort of one to one sessions that we can conduct in in one of the very few recreational facilities that we have. But the the, the league is about to start. So in two weeks' time, I think the league is is about to start. So the the, the professional clubs have been training, um, but they haven't kicked off yet. So we have to wait and see. There's uh, it's it's been a long time. You know, it's been a very difficult period for all of us. But um, you know, other countries seemingly have got their uh, have got their leagues together a little bit quicker than we have. Hopefully, we can we can rectify that soon and and, and see some domestic football here in the Philippines because it has been a long time. Uh, since we've been able to to see domestic football here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Coach Sutesh, what is it that in Malaysia that needs to change or improve for it to get to where you you think there should be so much potential? Yeah, that's right. You uh, you know, if you ask any uh, uh, fan or players or coaches. They they want to see the, the the country at the world level, you know, playing the World Cup and all this stuff. But let's be realistic here. Uh, you have to go step by step. And currently in Malaysia, the the latest development is uh, under FAM. They have the F30, which is uh, the plan up to 2030, and they have three phase in this plan. And that's where, like you know, the first phase is to to develop the uh, the coaches and at the at the development level, grassroots and all that, and also infrastructure. And the second phase is to uh, this is around seven years, and after that they'll be focusing uh, to to do well in uh, in Asia. And the next uh, before twenty thirty, they would like to reach uh, the world level, but. As I'm, I'm part of FAM as well, as I'm a coach developer as well in uh, uh, for grassroots. So it's a lot of hard work uh, uh, moving forward, but but we are working on that, you know. So mm -hmm. like, like what I was telling you, uh, here in the coaching development, uh, JDT as a club, they are doing their job very well, and also AMD, NFDP. Uh, they are doing it nationwide and FAM, they are pushing all the grassroots uh, clubs, community clubs uh, to be registered and to streamline them. So it's a, it's a nationwide effort actually. We, we have a big plan and a lot of hard work uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, so so my, my dream is, is kind of connected to this, you know, if the plan really works, Probably we will achieve our dream you know, by 2030. Yep. So that's uh, that's what's happening in Malaysia currently. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we have come to the end of the show. I have a lot of questions. Well, I have. I wish we had more time because you know you two boys, an interesting discussion. All right. So I hope football starts for you for in Philippines and Singapore soon. I think we all need that. That is, um, but thank you for your time and great sharing today. Um, I wish you all good luck and with you, Chris, with Kaya and um, Coach Money, with whatever you're doing. And I'm sure it's for good for, for the whole football in Singapore and in Coach Utah too, but with JDT. Okay. Hopefully, the dreams come through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay.